three, and we are live. Everyone, thank you for tuning in. We have people jumping on right now. My name is Yari Jadenko, and I'll be your host today. We have Fufan Bilal with us. I'm really excited to have our guest speaking today of some amazing information. Um, we are talking about notes and the way things are going, the way where we can invest and move forward. Um, how's everything with you, brother? Everything is great, man. Everything is great. I just I had lunch today um, with a good friend and we were actually talking about notes and he was telling me that it's a busy profession and he, busy professional and he's saying that um, he never knew about the note business and, and everything that comes with it and how you can make money in it and so many different ways. So he was he was excited about it. So I love talking notes. This is like therapy for me. I'm glad to be here. Thanks awesome. for having me on the platform. We're super excited to have you, brother. Thank you for coming out. You know, your your, your time is valuable. It's definitely the same as your knowledge. Um, you know, your experience, you have a lot of it. And we're really excited to learn, uh, get some gems out of you, you know, get some information. Um, for those who are joining in, guys, make sure you are asking questions as you might um, come up throughout the, uh, our conversation. Um, we might not answer right away, but we will get to it by the end of this chat, this live stream. Um, now, for those who might not know who you are and what you have done and, you know, where did you start from? How did you get into this niche and how did you find this niche? You know, real estate is a big vehicle. It's a large, massive vehicle. And there's so many niches. And as I'm realizing, there's not only niches, but there's also a niche within a niche. You know, which is, which, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. You know, notes is a definitely powerful vehicle. You know, um, some 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 people are, are new to this. The majority of the people who are watching, they are want to get into the, the notes industry and they're trying to figure out um, how they can help others, right? Because one thing I've learned about notes and how this entire business works, um, like personally speaking, I used to think that banks want to get to the foreclosure, right? Because they want to take away the property and they want to list it, they want to make money before I got into understanding what it really is. And now I'm realizing that foreclosure is actually the worst last scenario. Nobody really wants to get to the foreclosure table because the bank doesn't want to own it. You know, they don't want to kick out the owner. Um, you know, it's all about non-performing notes or performing notes and how do we get it to perform better, right? Make sure that things are moving the way they were originally planned, you know, when they got to the closing table. So I'm really excited to have you here to, to share your knowledge with us and, and, and tell us exactly how you see it um because we are in 2020 the times have changed since 2019 times have changed i'm going to 2021 uh, we have an election coming up we, you know it, and, and certain things are going to be changing you know especially with the evictions the foreclosures the courts opening up um so yeah we are in definitely in an interesting time that we are in and i'm really super excited to talk about this topic brother yeah awesome man i I like the time we're in now because it creates that adversity. It makes yep. us better. It makes us more than who we are. We have to be more creative. We have to dig deeper. Everybody yep. was comfortable, right? So you want to you want to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes, <laughs> that's the only way you're going to make it. You know. Um, so yeah, I got started. Uh, I've been doing real estate for 20 years. I got started in note business in 2011 by accident, doing a short sale on the phone with a negotiator, and they said, "Hey." You know, why don't you just buy the note? I'm like, what? What is that? So they, they began to explain it to me. I, I began. I mean, I know what a note mortgage was. I didn't know that you can actually buy them on the open market from a bank. I, I never knew banks actually sell this paper. Uh, so that intrigued me, and I started to do some research and you know watch webinars and go to different events. Um, and what really made me move forward is I had a meeting with um, one of my mentors, Dave Van Hall, PPR. He's actually on the event this week, so if you guys get a chance to see his presentation. Highly recommend it. Uh, but I took a meeting. I drove down to Dave's office, and he was gracious enough to take me to lunch and let me borrow some of his time. And we spent about two hours together that day. And I, you know, I was charged. I had a battery in my back. I drove two and a half hours back to New Jersey and started to figure out. Started to pick through all of the second mortgages because there's the niche. Would you say niche within a niche? He's they specialize in second. So I began to go through all of my short sell files at the time. I probably had 200 plus short sell files. I was managing almost 300 started to pick up all the second mortgages. So that was a low hanging fruit. And I started to, you know, take the, the stuff that I learned from the training and the stuff they had going there and started to work on some of the files that I actually had in house. And once I began to build a process, keyword, a process and understand 
how this thing worked, then I was able to go out and spend some of my own capital first uh, to go over the hill and get the arrows in my back and build case studies. Then once I was able to build a process and then build case studies, I was able to now uh, spend my own money, but case studies go in front of investors and say, hey, this is what I've done. I'm looking, I can get a bigger discount if I'm able to buy more. Who's in? And they were like, uh, we're not interested. We don't, we don't know anything about that. We like you as the property guy. We'll continue to give you money yet for the property, but we don't know about the notes. It's, you know, we, they didn't understand it. Right. So I had to continue to go on my own and, and just uh, reach out to some family members. And that kind of pushed me. Actually, my, my, um, at, the son, at the time, my son was eight years old. And we were, I was still doing short sales. And he heard me going back and forth. And he said, why don't you just create your own bank? And I was like, that's impossible. He's like, I just said anything is possible, Dad. Like, what's going on? So like, he caught you there. He, he got. I was like, all right, I got to do it. So that kind of led me to uh, searching and looking at uh, how to create a bank. And I found some information on the fund and called a couple of SEC attorneys. Created my first fund in 2013. Raised capital and was able to buy notes at a discount and use that same method, building a process. Uh, because I, I think everything is based off a of process and having the right people in place in the right seat, the right person, in the right seat. So once you learn how to do that, I mean, it's, it's basically, um, it's a science to it. It's, you know, these loans, if they fall in a certain category, you're going to see the same things over and over again. And, you know, I was telling Nick, I was like, Hey, you know, I want to talk about, um, on my presentation short sales, deed in lieu and foreclosure, because those are actually exit strategies that you have as a note investor. The most profitable exit strategy you're going to have is through the borrower, right? And if we foreclose, we fail. We don't want to take houses from anyone. Like you mentioned, the banks don't want to take houses. We want to work something out. I got into the note business at the time, trying to get away from the real estate business. Mm. Because before then I flipped. I'm sorry. Any reason you were trying to get away from it? I was trying to get away from it. I mean, the market tanked. Uh, you know, it was, it was, we were all doing short sales and this was somewhere around 2011 and the market, you know, was slow. It wasn't really where it is today. It's on fire today, out of control, insane. <laughs> but, you know, it was a slow, slow movement and, um, it was something new for me. And I was like, wow, I can actually help people and I can actually make money. Exactly. And feel, feel really good about it. And I didn't have to deal with the tennis, tallest trash and termites. So. You know, I got my note flag and I start going around. No more real estate. Notes, notes, no tennis, tallest trash and termites. So uh, I was ready to share what I learned with the world. And, you know, through my process, I started through my uh, growth. I started to teach people as I was learning. Right. As soon as I would learn something, I would put the concept together and actually do it because notes is a learn by doing business. And when it would work, I would go, oh, so then I started having meetings at my office for free. I would just have people and say, hey, I want to teach about the note business. I was going to wholesale meetings and real estate meetings like what about notes they were like what notes what are you talking about notes and this happened for years i was going around waving the note flag and everybody was flipping houses and wholesaling and i was like okay so i started to do that and uh slowly but surely over the years people started to catch on started to become more interested in it because i was actually posting case studies and you know real talk what i was doing and that attracted a lot of people and i think that helped me grow a lot also helping others uh, you know, trying to get into the business and not trying to set it up where it's okay, I'm going to help you, but you're going to partner with me or you're going to give me money. It right. was truly trying to help people understand this business uh, because there wasn't too many people. There probably was a lot of people doing it, but people who I didn't know in my circle, uh, in a regular RIA circle, who really what they wasn't doing notes. A few people, when I would talk to them, they would talk about subject, uh, subject to, uh, I'm sorry, seller finance, owner finance notes. Right. Uh, they were, wasn't talking about institutional notes. So, but anyway, getting back to the short sales, deed and loan foreclosure, the topic we're here to discuss. Uh, my first couple of, of, of exits uh, was, of course, through the borrower, very profitable, made great returns. But when I started to level up and buy more assets, that's when you have the opportunity to see different types of exit strategies. Yeah. And at first, I, I didn't understand the short sale process. I was like, okay, I know when I was doing short sales, I would have to get the approval from the first and then the second mortgage they you could just you know say hey if you don't take what the first is going to give you you're going to lose you're going to get wiped out because that's what i was taught and that's what i would say to the second mortgage guys and you know they would just you know bow down and say okay we'll take the thousand we'll take this we'll take that and i didn't understand and i was like they lose losing money maybe it's a tax write-off but when i was on the other side now 
it was a different game in the short sale. It was like, okay, same strategy. You go get the approved from the first, you come back to me, but now I'm going to sit on this because I'm, I'm not going to let the realtor make more than me. Right. Why should the realtor make $12,000 commission right. and you pay me a thousand? I don't care the first one. You want to pay a thousand. We just won't close. Right. It's full close on me. Wipe me out. And yeah. I started to notice that a lot of that was happening on deals that was already in foreclosure that I purchased. For example, case in point, the person took a mortgage for a second mortgage for 50,000. The first is in foreclosure. I bought a pool with the second with the first in foreclosure. It's underwater. They owe 50,000. Maybe that note cost me a thousand. Right. Right. Because they you just zeroes out on the sheet because, you know, the weighted average of the pool is what you pay the most for. So those the loans that have the more risk, you zero, you almost zero them out you know, on your sheet. So, you know, you have to put have some type of cost to it, though. So this loan may have cost me a thousand dollars on a book. So you come in and offer me a thousand. I'll break even. But they don't know that. Right. They owe fifty thousand. So I would say, I oh, know. We'll, we'll work this out for 15,000 and we'll make it happen. And we'll go back and forth, back and forth. The realtor need to give me a piece of the commission. And I would hold it deal hostage all the way to the end. And you wind up getting six, seven, eight thousand dollars or whatever it is. Um, and it's very profitable. They don't know you just made like a two, three hundred percent return. Right. And in some strategies we would do that. That's the short sale. So that's how that worked. Um, and you can hold deal hostages, hold deals hostage. Oh, those hostages. You can hold the deals hostage when you're doing short sales. I'm so excited. Tripping over my very, very excited, man. I love you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out with your with your battery full fully charged. And uh <laughs> it, it seems that you love you love this niche, you love this industry, and you're you're looking to help. And this is the most important thing is you know, once you start giving, you start receiving, which is uh absolutely big yeah. believe in that. The yeah. Deal. And I love something you mentioned. You so you know you had you had uh, agents come out to you and say, "Hey, this is how this is th is done." And you're like, "Okay, how do we figure it out?" Right? Like you're letting them to you, you're giving them the options of figuring it out. You're like, "Okay, how do you want to go about this?" And like this, you're like, mm, "It doesn't really work with me." Let's let's you know what else do you have? So you you you're letting another person kind of like negotiate with themselves. I actually did other strategies, and this is the last thing I say about short sales before we move to Deed and Lou. I've created in no holders. There's there's creative ways that you can actually structure deals, and um, you can actually go to the table and say, okay, they they don't want to pay. Let's say, for example, well, for Quan, they're not going to pay the five thousand. You can have a choice and say, well, I'm just going to lose the thousand dollars. My my cost basis on this loan and and move forward, or you can say, okay, look, we'll take uh, the thousand dollars or whatever it is if you go last minute, and that's all that you really figure out they're going to pay. But I'm going to release the the um, I'm going to release the lien from the property, but I'm still going to hold the owner liable for it. It'd be an unsecured note at that time. So what I'm saying is, you can create a situation where you can negotiate an unsecured note. You release the lien from the property and negotiate an unsecured note. But all I have to do is file bankruptcy, and basically you're you're out. There's nothing you can do. But you can still have other creative ways to uh, still collect on it, right? You got to figure out other ways, you know, or you could do something where the buyer bring money to the table and pay you, you know, right. as long as it's legit and you run it through the title company and it works out a you know? niche within a niche. <laughs> yeah. You can do that. I've done that several times. I mean, talk about getting creative financing and creative, you know, making creative deals and creative, you know, options are endless. It's just pretty much tapping in, you know, networking and figuring out, you know, the best case scenario. Um, so yeah, for those who, who joined us, thank you guys. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out. And, uh, I just want to repeat one once again. If you guys have questions, please do go ahead and pose them. We'd love to answer them. Uh, we'll probably get to the questions and answers at the end of this uh, live chat. Uh, whatever question you might have, please do have it posted because most likely another person like yourself has the same similar question. Um, so go ahead and pose them. We'd love to answer them. Um, today's topic is uh, no, no short sale, deed, lieu, and the foreclosure. So we are been talking about a little bit of, 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 um, of your, you know, your experience of 20 years, you know, you've already seen 2008, you're seeing 2020, you're seeing the dips, uh, you're seeing the ups and downs. And so, so how are you pretty much, are you changing your business structure? Are you changing anything? Are you, how are you adapting to moving forward? Right. Um, 2020 is about to you know come to an end and 2021 is about to start so do you see anything change moving forward into the next year um how are you structuring yourself 
Yeah, that's an awesome question. It, it, it blew by so fast, right? I remember it just being in January. But um, things have happened. It somehow flew by really fast. Yeah, not to get off no topic, I'll just touch on that real quick. We actually have a hybrid model now. So our fund invests in real estate and notes, and that kind of creates a buffer, a hedge against any market uncertainty. Uh, it's it's really, we have different income streams from rentals, flips, note sales, note income from performing notes, uh, everything real estate related. We we all we also buy tax liens, which is a way we get the notes, I mean, the, the properties at a bigger discount. So we have that uh, cash influx from those different income streams, uh, real estate related, real property and paper. So that's pretty much the model that we are working now. And I see myself working that model for a while. I've always done it in my personal portfolio, but I created a vehicle now where uh, capital partners could participate in that. Awesome. Um, but you know, with the note thing, as far as the, the other last thing I want to say on short sales was the whole goal guys is really let them get their approval on the first, first, and then come to you because now they did all of that work and you realtors, you know what I mean? Um, you spend a lot of time, a lot of work. I'm a realtor myself also. So I know what it is. You spend a lot of time work processing it. Then is you go to the guy who has the second mortgage and you know now you have to wait for them to approve it. So that would be that. The other exit strategy is Dean and Lou. Uh, again, I'm a seconds mortgage guy. So I've had so many different situations where I, the homeowner they only have two choices. Either they're going to stay in the house, or they're going to leave the house, right? If they're going to stay in the house, they're going to pay. You. Because if they don't, then they have to leave, right? right? Through foreclosure and, or through a deed in lieu, which is the next thing I wanted to touch on. Uh, the deed in lieu is, is a very creative structure. Uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with the concept. But before you do a deed in lieu, you want to have an attorney run a title search, a lien search, because some people might have judgments and other things on them. So if you just deed it over, that judgments are still on those properties. They only get extinguished if you foreclose and clean the title. So you definitely want to run a title first before you accept the deed in lieu uh, on a property. We've done a lot of success with deed in lieus and we make it very easy for them. We just take over the property and make they don't have to clean anything out. We'll clean it out. We'll put it back on the market for sale or we'll rent it if it's underwater. So it's a very creative strategy. We've been in situations plenty of times where the first didn't even want to foreclose. They just released their lien off the property because maybe it was somewhere in Aliquippa, PA or somewhere far where they didn't want to touch. Uh, and they just released their lien and wrote it off. And I became first because I was in second and a couple of scenarios like that. Or the, or the, the loan was paid down. Maybe I think I had a loan in Detroit and it was the first mortgage on it for like 2,500 bucks. And I had a second for like 30 something thousand. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> It's two more months. I'm going to be a couple more months. I want to be first mortgage. Wow. And, um, you know, the situation, I, I want to get in a deed in lieu of foreclosure on that one. So you, uh, so you second, you always chose the second option, right? So I mean, the second uh, position versus the first or, or was it, did, did you jump into that from the beginning? You know? Um, yeah. yeah. Is there any reason why you did that? Yeah. Because you get more loans uh, for more money. So, I mean, you basically for a hundred thousand, I was able to go get a handful of loans and kind of really figure it out. So, you know, back then you can get almost 10 loans for a hundred grand. Yeah, I think there were like eight loans or something for a hundred thousand. And, you know, it's, it's, I was buying seconds of people who were paying their first. So I knew they wanted to keep the house. So it was a probability game, right? So, okay. If I look at your credit and you're paying all of your debt, except for the second, you know, it's more than likely you're going to pay me. Um, or if I foreclose, why would you move if I'm just asking you for 300 bucks a month when that same three bedroom, one bath is going to cost you the same as your first and second mortgage. Plus you have to move uproot and move and pay rent and security and go through the hassle, which is instead of giving me a couple of grand and making a couple of hundred dollar monthly payment. So basically it's, it's this logic. Um, you know, you can lose, definitely lose money in this business for sure. I've lost money on loans. You know, I think every day I probably, there's no, there's no reward. <laughs> there's a, a tremendous upside. Yeah. There's, upside. Upside. there's no reward. So yeah. you, you met, so, so it looks like, you know, one is you're very patient. I will give you that because it, it, it is a time. It, it's a timing thing where you have to just wait it out. You have to be patient. You have to be consistent at it. And, um, and that's what you, you've pretty much been betting on and you've been winning on, but you've been very persistent at it as well. Yeah. I mean, I've felt that a lot of stuff also. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to sit him, but like, 
I know all the answers and I did it. We made right. so many mistakes, but that is what made us better. I was actually just having a conversation with my son yesterday. He just passed the New Jersey uh, real estate uh, school test and he's going to take the state test. He was like, I don't want to, I don't want to take the state test yet. I'm, I don't, I think I'm going to fail. I said, you should look forward to failing. He's mm -hmm. like, you read too many books. I said, what do you mean I read too many? He said, you should look forward to failing because that's what's going to make you better. You're going to yep. go back and you're going to try harder yep. to pass. So think of it that way and you'll be okay. But yeah, I mean, we failed and we we rebuilt, we rebuilt processes and things that made us better to make things easier to be able to scale. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough business and it does take patience. So it's not a get rich fast type of business it's a business that allows you to build monthly streams of cash flow allows you to help people give a homeowner reprieve share your discount with them it's a really good business i love it i'm passionate for it so, uh, so yeah so focusing on on notes right and uh if you had to start all over again um with the knowledge you have right now would you do anything differently would you change something would you how would you adapt and and, and moving forward right well what would you do differently if you if you were able to just with the real estate business in general, I would I would have try to get myself knowledgeable on different types of real estate, create mastery and then do a hybrid model, because I think that just doing one thing is high risk. Right. If you're just doing private lending and, you know, you're not diversifying with other things is high risk. If you're just doing notes and you're not diversifying is high risk. But within a note business, uh, what would I have done differently? I probably would have basically partnered up with some people, joined a mastermind. Uh, there's a lot of people who's doing group partnerships and learning from each other, which I think is beneficial. I've trained a lot of them. I've done masterminds uh, and I probably trained over 75 people through mastermind, but um, people after that, it was groups of maybe six to 10 people, three or four of those people partnered together, put their money together. Now they leverage human capital and actually capital. And they also had each other to bounce off of and learn different things and it was competitive right. with me i kind of started you know the lone soldier you know and it was i didn't have anybody to like compete against or or you know go back and forth with so that's probably what i would have done different i think that would have kind of propelled me faster or you know it's something very interesting about you is that you're an agent right so that's pretty much how you started in the game and so you looked at it you looked at the business as an agent right so you were kind of you know you you saw the both sides um, so, so, you know, for the agents who are watching us right now, what would you suggest for them um, who don't know the other side, you know? So what I'm trying to say is like, we have an awareness, right? Awareness where you have an awareness of the current state until you understand the other state, you know? With the few, so for example, when you're an agent, you're just aware as an agent would be when it comes out to short sale, but you don't understand the awareness of the investor, right? The first or the second. So what would you suggest for the real estate agents who are watching? Um, and then we'll, we'll, then we'll jump into the investors talking about their awareness to their, to their agents. So communication, how would you communicate better or how would the agent be able to um, penetrate better and to understand an, an investor, right? So if, if you if you put yourself as an, a real estate agent, uh, how would you, how do you do it? How would you do it and how, um, what do you suggest? What well, you I, I would pretty much find out uh, from investors, of course, which every agent do is basic, you know, what are they looking for? And then on the other side, if I if I know about notes and I know about certain things, I would try to figure out from my broker if if they're getting REOs, I would try to contact that bank and see, you know, if they have notes for sale. And then I would try to see if the investor is educated on the notes because that's the top of the food chain, right? You get the note before it becomes an REO. So I would try to figure out maybe some of those investors that are buying properties, they buy notes also. Maybe mm -hmm. they do sell a finance. So I would try to ask questions you know what type of investor are you are you just a fix and flip or are you just somebody who wants long-term investments do you know about note business do you know would you rather if i can get you a note and you had to finish the foreclosure would you be interested in that and i would try to tie them into other um sources i would try to broker note deals to them Love uh, it. To keep on the topic of notes uh I would, if i'm a realtor and i'm watching this if i'm an agent and I'm learning about note business. I'm fascinated with it. Maybe I don't have the capital to get started, but I want to get the knowledge and maybe I can help uh, these, these investors find deals and broker deals and make money in between. They can be brokers, note brokers. Yeah. So it's going back to, you know, diversifying, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All the time. So now, 
So now let's bring the awareness to the investor, right? So, so the people who are going into the in those business and, and they're dealing with um, agents and real, uh, brokers, what, what would you suggest to an investor? How do you tap in and how do you screen or, or, or better yet, like communicate better with their, or, or an agent or whoever has a deal that um, to get it to the closing table? Yeah, same way reverse. I tell all the agents that I deal with, hey, you know, if you find notes, because sometimes the banks are going to, most of the REO banks that's bringing deals to their broker, they actually own the note and they foreclose on it. Now it's an REO. So they have inventory. You just have to ask the right questions. So I would usually tell them, hey, I noticed this deal you have. This came from a bank that I buy notes from. Mm -hmm. you know, contact them and see if, you know, not for more REOs, figure out what do they have in the pipeline before it's about to turn an REO and see yeah. if they want to sell it, see if they want to assign that note over. We can work something out. I'll give you a commission. Your broker's already connected to the REO department. You know, they're feeding them a bunch of REOs. You know, get your broker on the phone with them and see if they can speak to that guy and say, hey, I have somebody who want to buy, buy this stuff before it becomes an REO. What do you, because they usually get it in the pipeline before they foreclose on it because they have the, um, you know, the, the agent doing due diligence and they say the broker, hey, I, I'm about to foreclose on this. We got, you know, final judgment or whatever the case is. And, or we're about to do a lockout. This is coming to you. Go let me know what the value could be. You know, the, if the broker has that connection, then the realtor has to tap into that and communicate with their broker to try to figure out, uh, you know, the source. So they just have to find a source and bring that source back. So I, I kind of train my agents and let them know or give them specific questions to ask so they can go back and bring me that information. That's how it's so, at. To, to recap, it's pretty much don't, don't make an assumption, right? Don't make an assumption that the agent knows, you know? And the second thing is make sure you reach out, communicate, very important to communicate, be transparent and maybe even educate that agent and exactly what you want and what you're looking for. And most likely they have it. They don't even realize that they can offer it to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to and touch on the last thing on foreclosure, which is the other uh, topic, want to talk on that a little bit. I, I mentioned before, if we foreclose, we fail. We don't want to foreclose. We really want to work something out with the homeowner. Of course, we have investors. If we're not able to work something out, we have to move forward and take that asset. Now, when we take that asset, there's a couple of strategies that we do. If it's out of state, right? Because the real estate that I do is local to me, New Jersey, in the five counties I've been investing in for the last 20 years. So uh, when it's out of state, let's say if somewhere like is in Chicago, or if it's in somewhere in Georgia or Florida, like I don't have contractor resources out there that I can put together right away or property management. So what I'll do is I'll go online to the Facebook groups in that, in that area, right? Not me, my team will go online to the Facebook groups in the area and basically uh, on LinkedIn or bigger pockets, wherever, and they start to market that property and say, Hey, seller finance, you know, 20% down, we'll finance it to you. And then I'll turn that real estate property that I foreclosed on back into a note, a short term note, uh, you know, I'll do a, a interest only. I'll take 20% down and basically go from there. Or I try to structure something where there's some proper participation. If I think it's a lot of meat on the bone and it's someone who is very flexible, we'll work something out and oh, hey, give me one second. Um, we have a little difficulty on connecting up. Oh. Oh, yeah. We're good now. Yep. No. Go ahead. So, so I mean, that's, yeah, I was saying I'll try to turn it back into a note. Uh, I'll foreclose on it and, you know, do some seller finance strategy, try to turn it back into a note, a short term note Got it. Go from there or I'll foreclose on it and rent it out or foreclose on it and sell it. Um, you know, those are the options that I do when I when I go foreclosure and take a property. Got it. Awesome. So um, so you are yourself, a, you're an agent, so you, uh, you have a MLS access and and so forth. Um, now, for people who are not agents, uh, who don't have you know MLS access, or or even you know, how do you market, right? How do you what do you where where are you tapping in, you know? And what would you suggest? You know, there's a lot of different areas, there are different um, alleyways that you can go into and, and figure out how to get those leads. What would you suggest is the best way? What has been working for you? Yeah, so for we're talking about two separate things. So I'll touch on notes first, since that's the subject matter. For notes, how I source my notes is basically I, I connect with brokers. I, I find people who are brokering loans from banks direct, and I kind of just follow the trade, right? So a trade comes out, I'm not going to bid on a trade because everyone is going to bid up, right? So I'll wait till the winner is. I'll follow up with the broker and say, hey, just give me some color. It means pricing on what, you know the range of where that trade fell at. The broker would give me that information, and I'll find out who it is. I'll wait three, four months. I'll run title on a few and I'll find an assignment recorded to the person who want to trade. 
And then I'll do a mail campaign to them. I'll call them up, figure out who's in charge. Hey, do you want to sell some of those assets? Oh, we're still boarding. We're still going, maybe, maybe. And I'll just keep following up, following up, follow up. Uh, they have these note uh, events that they have, uh, IMN or these different high level note convention or note servicing events in Texas all the time every year. And I'll kind of look on a roster and I see that company who purchased the, that pool is there. Okay, good. I'm going to go there and meet that person in person now. So it's different things. I have a mail campaign going, an email campaign going, a phone call campaign. If I got the person's cell number, I got an RBM going to them. Hey, it's me again, just following up with you to see if you had any of So it's different strategies and techniques that I use to keep following up on, on social my deals and, you know, I, I agree with you. The money, the money, is the money, is money but surely the deals come through and you get trades. Now you have to perform, right? And you only as good as your last trade. If you go and spend a few hundred thousand or a million or whatever it is now, it's like, okay, you did that last quarter. What are we doing this quarter? We got, we, you got more money. So that, that's how it is. Um, but this source and deals, I mean, it's hard to find no deals on MLS. It's hard to find anything on MLS now. <laughs> I didn't forget <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Real yeah. estate, you know, okay. um, it's just so being creative. Network. Yeah, yeah, network through your network. Also, there's a lot of note events. There's note expo, there's paper source. Uh, there's this this one, the stress expo. There's so many note events that you can find and just jump in the chat and ask questions. Who has notes for sale? It's not really hard finding notes. Um, it's not really hard. There's so many groups on LinkedIn. You just have to put the work in, man. Yeah. It's not so, for example, you can reach out to a bank and ask them which agents they're working with and just reach out to those agents. Is that correct? Um, the bank is it's pretty tough. I mean, I, you can go to right. local community banks. You know, right. you, you trying to walk in the chase and say, I want to buy notes. They look at you like, what? They don't even know. Yeah. The front office don't even know. That's back office stuff. So, you know, if you go to a local community bank where they hold their paper, you might speak to the president or somebody there and, he might have some default of paper there that he might can sell you as possible. I know some people who've been very successful at doing that. Um, credit unions and stuff like that. You may have some success there, but trying to walk in Banker America Chase, uh, you know, unless you got connects. The front office really don't know too much about going on. The store really don't have an idea what's happening behind the scenes. Yep. So um, that's that's pretty tough. You know, people would say reach out and say, hey, there's this house I found, and I know you do notes. Can you can you get the note for me I'm like it just doesn't work that that simple right it's you have to, the notes fall in stages right um the banks because of uh you know you, bank, uh just kind of simply uh keep putting like what are the stages uh, and how many stages are so, there so what happens is default then it goes to collections right and then you know at the collections they try to do loan mod during that process if they can't do a loan mod successfully of course they start in foreclosure within that period you can do short sale Right. So um, not to really dive too deep, but, you know, there's pooling and service agreements, the remic and all that stuff, uh, 424B, something, 4245B perspective or something. I can't remember off the top of my head. But in those agreements, it's certain things that they can do with the loans that are in those pools. Uh, you know, they if they can, they can um, uh, either if they short sell them, they have certain uh, number they need to reach to cover the investors. If they sell them, there's so many different things that they do. So they fall in different stages. And that when I was going back to the beginning, when I was speaking to that uh, negotiator, he said, why don't you just buy that note? You know, I found out that, you know, that note, other notes were in the stage where they can actually sell the note and assign it to recap. Uh, because if they foreclose at that time, going through the foreclosure process probably would have cost them 50 grand to foreclose. Mm -hmm. Probably would have took them a year. So right. they want to get quick, good liquidity. They can sell the note and don't have to pay the legal fees and yeah. still make a higher profit than they would in a short sale. Yeah, nobody would win in that transaction. Yeah. yeah. So we pretty much talked about, uh, you know, how to marketing. Um, you know, it's all about really uh, following up. The money's in the follow up, um, and and then get building leads, building relationship, building rapport um, with with agents who deal with the with the certain um, you know REOs. Or you know, before it goes to for foreclosure, and seeing what kind of uh, warm leads they might have that might be going into foreclosure in the future. Um, now, now moving forward to um, pretty much, and while we we kind of wrapping it up, guys, make sure you ask, uh, ask questions. We'll we'll get to the questions in a minute. Um, you know, I, I'm seeing a few questions already, so we'll definitely be answering those. Um, so yeah, so um, we spoke about you know no, uh, no short sale and so forth. 
Is there any um, suggestions besides, you know, uh, take massive action and be persistent uh, for newbies? Um, is there any kind of like things that sh newbies should watch out for when getting into this business? Um, and then we'll talk briefly about, you know, um, raising capital because it sounds like you, in a way where your son told you, open up a bank. <laughs> so we'll get that to uh, next. Um, so is there any things before we move, over, uh, move on to the next topic? Is um, any, any suggestions to the newbies besides, you know, network and take massive action? Yeah, I mean, for the newbies, it's it's people always say, get around somebody who's doing it, get them into it, right? That's the basics. Uh, you know, take massive ass action. That's another thing. And, and, and build your network. So for me, I, I would just say so many people are afraid, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, yeah. want, they want to do something, but they don't know how to move forward. Um, that's the biggest thing is learn how to move forward, right? Learn how to stop being a tire kicker. Like that's what I would just straight up. Yeah. If you want to do it, then do it. Right. Do it. Do it now. Like, what, what are you waiting for? You, you're going to lose money. You're going to make mistakes. Right. OK. You you understand that. Now move forward. I'm yeah. just being direct because and I'm saying this to say because I was going out for free. Right. Educating people. Look, what I was basically doing was I saw a lane where nobody was educating on notes in my local area. And I was like the only guy. So I was like, okay, if I educate them, they could potentially become note buyers yep. of product that I have because now they understand the business, right? So it worked hand in hand. They they learn a business, they go off and they on they do it. I can possibly sell some notes to them because now they educated and know how you know what the note is about. But when I was doing that, people were you know after a year, no one was taking the next step and buying notes. And I said, hey guys, what if I do a situation where I actually held your hand? And walked you down the street and said, "Come on with me." Now you invested, oh. your money. you invested your money, and I'm gonna take you step by step, and I'm gonna spend two days with you for three months, two days a week. Who would do that? Wow. Everybody, oh, I would do it. I would do it. And I found out that people don't want to go by themselves; they want to go and do it together, and they want the person to hold their hand because they are free. So yeah. get into a group. That's the us. Figure uh, other people who you can leverage your your capital with and you can leverage uh, that experience with and just do it now i don't do uh, the mentoring and training and all that stuff um anymore i got so much content on youtube so much free stuff i've done for years um anybody who's who may be local a lot of you guys may be local if this is you know the nick tang network uh so to speak you've seen me out here you see me giving stuff for free you know i got stuff on youtube go there first go through all those hundred videos then come and ask me questions because <laughs> I created yeah. it so yeah. you can understand from beginning to end. And then once you're ready to get started, you know, definitely I'm here to help. So when people will reach out to me, hey, I got a few questions. Let's, let me take you out to lunch. Let me on the call. Hey, watch those 100 YouTube videos first. Yeah. Then all at me. Then I'm yeah. ready because now you have less questions and we're ready to get to get to it. No, I, I completely agree with you, brother. Like before I started investing myself in real estate, Fear was definitely getting the best of me, right? It, I, I started educating myself, then I over educated myself, and then I realized, okay, I know everything. I know a little bit too much now because I'm, you know, I know everything about you it. You never know enough. Yeah, you but, but enough. I think it's like sometimes I'm like, oh, well, I'm gonna become a rehabber. I'm gonna become, you know, a flipper. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the buy and hold. You know, once you find your character, and the only way you find your character is by taking action. So uh, before we move over to uh, raising capital, what, uh, what is the first action besides, you know, educating themselves? You know, how do they get over the fear? Like, what spend would that say? money. Spend that money. Go buy a note. Mm. Go buy a note. Yes. Go buy a note. Now you have to move forward. Yes. And that's getting I'm back to the mastermind I was doing. I was like, hey, guys, for $25,000, i will get you a couple of notes. Now you got this money. You got me to help you. You actually got the notes. Now you don't have a choice. Now you actually have to either fail or succeed. So yeah. um, that... Yeah, spend your money and now it becomes serious. Invest in yourself. Oh, yeah. I love it. yeah. Yeah. Not buying the education. Go buy a note. There's a bunch of people out here selling note courses and all this other stuff. Use that money. And nothing wrong with that, but use that money. I would buy a note. Yeah. Right. I would buy a note. So um, I reversed it. I actually, you know, when I met uh, the guys at PPR, they had trained and everything else. I went out and bought some notes first. I tried to find a, a map of Chicago. Uh, I went what they say. I try to look for a city in Chicago with a map of Detroit. <laughs> I, try to, I try to do it on my own. I was like, ah, I'm not going to pay for train. I'm going to figure this out myself. I'm smart. I know real estate. You know, I fell miserably. I tried to work the notes that I had. I went and bought notes. And then eventually I was like, you know what? 
these guys already built it, built the model. Let me go and figure it out. And I was able to learn. So getting training and getting yourself around somebody who's in a business is definitely good, but you have to buy the notes. Like you got to buy the notes because you're going to be able to figure out, pull it apart. And now you got something to talk about. It's a learn by doing business. Exactly. I love it. Something to talk about. Because you, you come in and you say, hey, I took action. This is where I'm at versus, hey, what should I do? Right? Yeah. 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 It's, I have people always come to me like, what should I do? I'm like, you know, take action. They're like, oh, I'm scared. And I'm like, well, once you get over the fear, you know, come back to me. We'll talk about it. But here's some things you should do for now. They don't want it. You yeah. don't want it. If you're yeah. not taking yeah. if you're not going to do it, then you don't want it. You don't yeah, want it. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you, brother. Awesome. So, um, so you mentioned about becoming a bank. Um, did you end up doing that? Or what, what what happened with that? And how did oh, for sure, that? for sure. So, uh, I, you know, I spent probably around almost thirty grand uh, my first fund, and and most of that was uh, from an attorney at the time. I think his rate was like four hundred, four fifty an hour, and just trying to get to understand how to how the operating agreement should be structured. That's where you, I found myself where I spent the most money at really structuring the operating agreement and um, finalizing everything and understanding how it works and uh, what you can and can't do what you you know how you can market uh you know who you can raise capital from the the content you should have it just took a lot now they have a lot of these uh one-stop shops that say hey we can actually create the the private placement for you and help you raise capital well by the way we want 70 percent of your your your, your profits um, you know they have the boiler template and people try to Get the get the document from them, then go out and raise cash. It's just crazy. I would get with an SEC attorney, somebody who's going to help you, um, you know, through the ups and downs. Who's going to educate you? I mean, you have to figure. They work with a bunch of clients. They've seen this over and over again. They they know how it should be structured for what you're doing specifically. Uh, when it, when they come to notes, like you know, I wanted to raise capital for notes, and I needed to know how it should be structured and and what I need to do. So once I got over that and spent about thirty thousand dollars setting up this vehicle, and I had fear too, because I was like, I don't want to put this money out. And then what if I don't raise the money? Right. Then I was like, okay, I can't think like that. So I started thinking I raised $5 million. I raised $5 million, which is relatively small, believe it or not. Um, and I was like, okay, if you spend $30,000 to raise $5 million, that's nothing. Right. It's going to cost you 30, plus you get the money back. Plus yeah. you get that money back because you know, that's money you get back. So you're investing um, in yourself. Yeah. So when I started to look at it that way, I became more confident and um, you know, paid the money and, and got it done. And the, the biggest challenge then became raising capital because that's a whole nother business. Yeah. It's a relationship business and mm -hmm. real solid relationships for people to know, like and trust you take time. You have to have a track record. Um, you know, it's a lot that comes with it. So it's not like, okay, you go spend this money, you create a fund and you go say, Hey, I got a fund and people start throwing money at you. No, there's steps to it. And it takes years, you know, so, when you being, really so transparent is definitely a one I would definitely should you know, agree with you. So you said track record, um, did, before, you know, the first time you raised money, was it from friends and family or did you go straight to, you know, accredited investors? Friends and family. What was the yeah, friends and family. I, I didn't do accredited investors until my to my third fund. So uh, it was kind of laggy. It's still going, so I'll keep going. But friends and family uh, was you know where I started at, and you know I you know it's a I didn't like that because it kind of limited me on what I can do. Right, as far as I couldn't stand in front of a room and say I'm paying ten percent. You know, now I could be here and say, hey, guys, I'm raising capital 10 percent. You're a credit investor. Holla at me. Yeah. You know I mean? But back then I, I couldn't do that because of the type of fund that I had structured. So mm -hmm. I started off with friends and family. And um, I remember my cousin gave me money. He was a big stock guy and he had this portfolio he would brag about. And, you know, he gave me 10 grand and said, OK, let me see what you do. And at the time, I think I was paying like, I don't know, 12 percent or whatever return. And uh, he would call me like every two weeks. How's it going? How are we doing? How are we doing? I would see my family function. How's it going? How are we doing with the investment? I'm like, do you call like the guy you got your money invested with stock, the the broker that you do? Did you call him every week like you bother me? Like, I want to give you this money back. Like, leave me yeah. alone. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. these these are and I was grateful for everything that I that the people who invest me at that time, but when you dealing with an investor who cannot take a substantial loss, when you deal with an investor who can't give you fifty thousand if something go wrong, they won't speak to you again. I don't want to deal with that type of person. 
I want to deal with someone who's educated, who's sophisticated and know that nothing is guaranteed, you know? So basically those are accredited investors. So I kind of made the switch to that and started dealing with more high net worth people who could stroke a bigger check and you, you deal with less people. Yeah. Right. Like I don't want to manage people. I want to manage money. Love it. Like, do I want to manage a hundred people or do I want to manage 10 people with more money? Exactly. So when I started to change my mindset on that, I kind of shifted over to you raising capital. Yeah, raising capital from a credit investor. I was thinking, I don't have anybody accredited in my network. I may know one or two people, you know? Then I was like, okay, well, you in the wrong circles. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you, that's to show you right there, if you you hanging around the wrong people, if, yep. you're not, if you're not around somebody who net worth is a million dollars, like, what are you doing? Like, exactly. exactly. So you, went, so you went from raising first it was you know friends and family uh you raised that you realized there was a lot more stress than needed to be um and then you started thinking bigger and started you know reaching out to accredited investors uh who pretty much have experience education and access to cash so uh, excessive cash so what exactly the how did you market did you start networking you know did you go out to events how did you how did you put your physical self in, in front of those who had the money to actually lend you to start raising the you know credit investors uh, capital funds? Yeah, so I started to find places where high net worth people were. You know, the Rotary clubs, yacht clubs, uh, different charity events, uh, just different places where high net worth individuals were, and I would just put myself in those places. And people were, you know, country club. I became a member of a country club and started to go to events and hang out at the bar and go to the family function events. And again, it's a relationship business. And I would never go to these events like I'm, I'm here to raise capital. Who got the money? Who got the bag? You know, I would never do that because nobody is, is going to give you money right then and there. It, nobody's going to give you money a year after they meet you. It can take two or three years for them to get to know you, like you and trust you. So yeah. my whole goal was, OK, I need to change my circle and I need to be around high net worth people. I need to hear those conversations. I need to have those talks. I need to figure out how did they get to that level, right? So I started to join masterminds and do certain things. Like certain masterminds won't let you in unless your net worth is a certain amount, yeah. right? Because they don't want to have tire kickers in there. They want to have people who can add value to each other. Like minded. So I, yeah, so I started to spend money and join masterminds and get myself around these group of individuals and get to know them and build relationships with them. And yeah. then after you build the relationships with them and you have a track record and, you know, they may want to do business with you. So it's, it's a relationship business and it takes time. I'm still trying to figure it out, man. I don't have all the answers to that. As again, this is a whole separate business. Yep. Some people just raise capital um, and they, they're really good at raising capital. Yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, you're right. You, you, you really have to get yourself in front of those people who are not tire kickers. And you have to, you know. Um, and you have to also provide value. You can't come and say, I need money. I need money. It's always value asking. It's People always are not going to really, value. they are, you know, separate you, you themselves with you versus if you just explain what you're doing. And I've been hearing this a lot throughout the days that, you know, there is, it's not really a pitch, but it's really, you come out, you give value, you know, and when somebody asks, what do you do? You explain it to them. And you're talking, you know, and again, you, you, you're being around doctors and lawyers and, and, and individuals who are making money but they don't have time to do notes. They don't have time to invest themselves. What they do want is to actually make more than the bank is giving them on their on their money on the interest. So they want to, you know, have somebody like yourself who is fully invested in, you know, in, uh, in, 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 in figuring this out and making sure that the money is making money. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so let's 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 start off with questions. Um, let's go over the first question. All right. So, uh, so we go, you want to go ahead and, and grab this one? Do you need license to raise capital? That's is that the question? Do you need do you need some license kind of license on that? I'm not so, sure which part is that related to notes or raising capital. So it was asked uh, at 335 when we just started talking. Um, so I'm guessing uh, the question is really broad. Uh, notes. What? Yeah. You know, so for example, uh, becoming an agent, you do need a license. Um, is there any other uh, license? For, for notes, yeah, you need collection license, service and license if you operate in certain states. When I first got started, it was the Wild Wild West. You need a lot of license to do certain things. Um, now with the regulation that's out, you do need uh, to have your loans with the license service. So you need to have collection license uh, or debt buyer license in certain gotcha. states. It's not, it's not expensive, guys. It's, it's, it's not expensive at all. A couple thousand dollars. Uh, some states you have to take tests. Of course, you can't have a criminal record. 
and and basically you know that's that it's very simple it's not difficult at all most important thing is check your state whatever you're gonna that's it yeah perfect all right let's go with this do you do still do meetings? Uh, you mentioned before that you go out and network and so forth. Um, so those meetings she was talking about when I used to do the meetups, this was earlier on. Uh, of course, now with COVID, you know, I haven't done a meetup in a long time. It's probably since 2017. I had a big meetup group, over 1,500 people in a group. I actually gave it to uh, someone else who was doing another event. And basically, no, it's the answer to the question. I don't do those meetings. Again, YouTube, put my name in YouTube go back to like 2012 and you'll see I got over a hundred videos just specifically on notes. So awesome. you'll find a lot of great information and content there. And that's also a great way to market yourself. Cause you know, if somebody asks, oh, how do I learn? Go to my YouTube channel, right? So you're, you're yeah. showing them, you're building rapport, you're showing them that you're real, you're educating them, you know, in case they have questions and at the end of the day, they're going to be like, you know what? I feel comfortable with you. You have yeah. video, your educational material. I would like for you to take my money, invest it in and, and get an interest on it. Um, so with kind of, this is a, so you mentioned before that you were willing to hold somebody's hand, right? Meet up with them with twice a week, every week for three months to make sure that there's no, you know, they, they purchase, they buy. Do you still do that or similar something to that? No, I, I don't do that. Um, I realize that time is more valuable than money. Um, you know what I mean? So I have, I have two boys that I'm raising and, and I have a business I do full time. And, you know, when I did that at the time, it it actually grew faster than I thought it would grow. I only wanted to do like 10 people and I was charging like 25,000 a person and it wound up turning into 75 people over two years. And I was like, okay, I don't want, let me take the trainer head off. I'm not an educator. I'm not trying to sell training courses. So, um, you know, I almost went down that lane and I was like, okay, let me pivot from that. Um, and I, I just did it to help people get off the fence, so to speak. Right. Uh, but there's so many people out here now that do it. Um, you know, you have, uh, Sherman Arnowitz, who's another speaker here who does that. He actually will hold your hand and walk through the process. Uh, you have Martin Signs, I believe he's a speaker here also. There's so many people who have those mentorship programs where they hold your hand. Got it. And awesome. do it with you. Judgment stay on the seller's personal when you're doing deed in the year. So um, it's attached to the property. So the judgment is attached to the property. So if someone gets a judgment on them, it goes on the on the, the assets that they have. So when you're doing a deed in lieu, you want to run a title because you know the only way those judgments can be extinguished is if you foreclose on them or if you work something out and you know you pay it, pay a discount and get the judgment removed. So yeah, they stay on the property. Got it. Next one. At what stage of the process do you find the best deals? Uh, so every deal is, is, it's not the, it's what you pay for it, which makes it a good deal. Right. So every note is different. Um, you know, you have to, once you learn the business, you'll learn what is your risk tolerance basically is the real question is what's your risk tolerance. If you have something that, you know, you don't want to take any risk and you want to buy something with a bunch of equity and low risk, then of course you're going to pay more. Uh, but there's deals out there everywhere. Um, you got to learn how to buy some deals with hair on it also to learn how to navigate in that because that best deal can turn into the hairy deal. And uh, what I mean by that, you can buy a second with full equity behind a first that's current and then they have uh, the husband and wife die and they can't afford a note and then the first starts to snowball and the the equity starts to go down from the foreclosure cost and you get wiped out. So that can turn into something else. So, you know, you'll learn that as you get educated. Got it. Oh, um, didn't show up. There we go. So we kind of, we talked about this. Um, so pretty much buying your first note, it would be the best action they can take. Yeah. Yeah, buy first note. yeah. So the question is, where would you suggest someone to start if they are brand new in note investing? So taking massive action and go ahead and purchase your first one. Yeah, absolutely. Take a massive action and purchasing your first note. And then from there, you will kind of, you know, Two feet in, so to speak. There You're in, go. and you got to do it. The, the second other question is also, what advice do you have for someone with a low amount, low amount of capital? I got it. So I, again, leveraging human capital, you get yourself educated, 
and partner with someone who has the capital and then you have the experience and knowledge you know you can do that as well and then over and you can broker deals to build your capital and you can you can find deals and bring it to people who have deals that you know people who want to buy deals and go from there awesome perfect um so we have this one uh can you share your channel link uh yeah just if you go to youtube and just type in fuquan Bilal, it'll come up just type in my name exactly how it's spelled in youtube in the search bar and you'll see uh any video that comes up that little circle you just press my picture boom you're on my page awesome so i do see uh, you have a facebook is that correct? Is this yeah, correct? Facebook, I have that. And then uh, uh, YouTube is the way everything is at. Perfect. Is there any other ways to be able to uh, to get a hold of you? Or this is pretty much this is the best way to join? And, and Yeah, I'm on Facebook. You can hit me on Facebook in the Messenger. Um, you can shoot me an email. Pretty much go from there. But if, you, if you're if you looking to learn more and watch some of those videos, you can go to YouTube. It's a bunch of Facebook pages. There's a lot of great speakers here also that is in the industry a lot of people who i learn from who, who mentor me as well still to this day um so I just connect with the, a lot of the speakers and try to reach out to those guys follow them on social you know read whatever books and training material they have and you'll be able to level up so yeah so yeah again uh, it's really simple pretty much your um uh let's see so yeah, so pretty much just just googling your name, everything kind of comes up. All your or social media, um, your yeah. So there you go. You're definitely being consistent, brother. You're definitely being active, which I love. And thank you for sharing your knowledge, your experience. You you really are giving a lot, um, and not asking anything in return. Which is uh, this is why I feel like a lot of things have been happening for you in a, in a positive way. And, and again, um, you're doing, you're giving before you're asking. So it's a, it's an amazing thing that you're doing. Thank you. I really appreciate it, but I do have one ask. Yes. Take action. <laughs> I love it. I completely agree with you. Take out, you know, massive action plus, you know, being persistent equals results equals profits. Yep. Definitely All the agree. time. Before we go, do you want to uh, add anything to, to, to the viewers? Um, anything that we might have missed? Uh, I mean, you, you've you covered every every aspect there is. I, I definitely appreciate it. And I think. We've given more than needed. You specifically have given more than needed to take action, and uh, just really up to the, up to the viewers and up to them. Um, and again, uh, if if somebody can reach out to you, you you'll be able to get back to them and uh, and, and move forward. You know, Facebook. Yeah, for sure. I would definitely say, um, you know, for those of who are interested in more information, please go to the uh, the YouTube page, put my name in, look at some of the older videos watch as many as you can because some of the questions you're going to ask me i've already answered them uh in the in the videos that you're going to watch so some people don't want to watch videos they just want to connect with you and ask you and tie up your day and ask you 20 questions and i would definitely say go watch that stuff you'll learn so much i've actually had people come to me and say hey man just from your youtube videos alone i got into the business and i learned more stuff and connected with the right people who you had who you interview i reached out to those people so as a whole network of people, also the speakers here, I would say try to connect with some of the speakers here. Everyone here is really good in, in sharing and spending their time and answering the questions. So really reach out to these people and 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 communicate. That's what I would say. Yes, uh, awesome, awesome. So you know, two, I would say with two things we, uh, we request from you guys. One is uh, definitely go ahead and take massive action. And second is, you know, go ahead and subscribe to your YouTube channel, your Facebook uh, group. Make sure you like it, comment, um, share. And just yeah, just just maybe if you see any value, go ahead and share with your friends, and make sure that uh, you're sharing, you're sharing and caring. Awesome for for anybody who actually subscribed to my YouTube channel, I actually got a free book for them. Ooh, I got a free book, my last book, Passion for Real Estate Investing. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, leave me a message on my YouTube saying, "Hey, I just subscribed, and you know, I'll be sure to get you a copy of that free book." It's there a gift. Go. See? There we go. Still awesome. giving. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you guys. Thank you for everybody for tuning in. And again, I uh, really appreciate it for you, brother, to come out, give me your time, give me knowledge. Um, and, you know, I, I'm really excited for our next uh, interview, for our next uh, live. And uh, looking forward to that. Absolutely. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Enjoy your Saturday. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.